go. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Lincoln City Council meeting of February 12th, 2018. Let us all rise for a pledge of allegiance followed by a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get down to our regular order of business, I'd like to acknowledge the mayor is here for the Mayor's Award of Excellence. Welcome, sir. Councilman Christensen, members of the council, thank you very much for allowing us a little time to recognize the people, the workers of the city of Lincoln who are doing such a fantastic job for you and I and the citizens. And now we're back to January and we'll have 12 more great stories to tell you this year with a lot more great stories that we don't get to tell you. But the award for January is being presented to William Mall, Bill to his friends, who works in the StarTran division of our Public Works and Utilities Department. He is a journey mechanic and has been employed with the city since 2009, nominated in the category of Valor by Bus uh, Maintenance Superintendent Glenn Knust for helping to save the life of a co-worker. One morning in December, Maul saw a co-worker sit down abruptly and complaining of a terrible headache. A short time later, the co-worker gasped twice and slumped over in the chair. When Maul discovered the co-worker was not breathing, he immediately called 911. He immediately began CPR as instructed by the 911 operator until paramedics arrived about three minutes later. Uh, his supervisor praised Maul, saying that his quick and deliberate actions, it's as simple as this, saved the life of a co-worker. So it's my pleasure to present Bill with uh, the Mayor's Award of Excellence for January. Please join me in congratulating him for his hard work and his commitment and his quick action. Bill, please come up. I think Mike uh, wanted to say a few words, as superintendent. I also wanted to congratulate Bill on his heroic efforts and the fact that he jumped into action um, to help a coworker and then stayed with that coworker is to be commended. And I personally congratulate you on receiving this award and, and on behalf of the StarTran team, congratulate you. So great job. Okay, we'd like to have all three of you gentlemen stand close to each other so we can get a photograph for posterity's sake. <clears throat> well, we got somebody else over here to take a picture right here. All right. We can give him a chance to introduce him. Yes, he will. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bill. Would you please say some words and make sure you introduce your, your guests with you today? Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Pat, my wife, and my daughter, Krista. And I'd just like to say thank you for this award. Uh, I'm just glad it all turned out real well. You know, uh, Charles is doing okay now, so. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. We'll now, we'll now continue with our meeting. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted to the back of the chamber. The order of business of the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first. 
Then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on an issue, on any issue, not on the agenda for that date, nor planned for a future agenda. Will the clerk please call the first item? Yes. Just for the public's notice, due to the President's Day holiday, the City Council will not meet on Monday, February 19th. Our first item is our public hearing consent agenda, items 1 through 16. Is Gab Gabriel Ronk here? Please come forward, sir. Hello. Tell us about your appointment. So, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Um, I started in Lincoln as a plumber back in 1993, and this is just my 25th year that has just started as far as uh, in the plumbing trade. Um, excited to actually be appointed to the board, the examining board, so that I can, as I get older, I start to feel more and more of a need to give back to the community, back to the trades, and I'm excited to be able, as part of this appointment, to do that with some of the upcoming individuals within the plumbing industry, the trade itself, and just being able to help educate them moving forward. Okay, questions? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for service. Does anyone else wish to come forward for an item on the consent agenda, items 1 through 16? Okay, next item, please. All right, if not, we can vote on these items. Items 1 through 3 were introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. <coughs> Items 4 and 12 through 14 were introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next, then, are our public hearing liquor resolutions. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward, yes. raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. I will call items 17 and 18 together. They are the application of Hunky Dory LLC, doing business as the Royal Grove for a Class C liquor license at 340 West Cornhusker Highway, and the related manager application of Eli Mardock. Is anyone here to speak on this item? Please come forward. Please come forward. Would you raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you barely believe it to be? I do. Thank you. State your name and address. My name is Eli Mardock. I live at 1521 Sunset Road in Lincoln, Nebraska. My name is Luther Mardock. I live at 4323 Mayberry Street in Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, please tell us about your application. Uh, the application is for the Royal Grove um, with Hunky Dory LLC. I am the manager of the LLC. Luther is the managing member of the LLC. And uh, we hope to bring back the Royal Grove. Uh, it's a historic venue that has operated there 47 out of the last 51 years. Um, and at one time was considered one of the best venues in the city and is the second largest in the state as far as the club goes. Uh, we think it's an ex exciting opportunity to uh, add a, bring back a vibrant and uh, uh, you know, cool historic venue to the city of Lincoln. Okay, other questions from council members? Carl. Yes, thank you. Um, Eli, you've, you've had some SDLs and have, have had some events over the last few weeks. Right. How's it gone? Great. The response from the community has been fantastic, and the, the events, um, I think the amount of press generated from this, uh, both with television and Lincoln Journal Star, um, has shown there's a lot of community excitement about it, and the events themselves have been really successful, so it's been positive. Good. Good. And as you know in talking, that the, there's a zoning issue that we've got to resolve, so uh, in your events, how has have there been any any issues with neighbors? Any problems there? I believe I was informed by Norma Jelsma, who's the owner of the building, that there was a noise complaint on one of the nights. Okay. So um, 
we're not sure who it was, of course. I don't think we received any other complaints. And we're taking a, a few, uh, uh, we're doing a few things to essentially make the uh, room a bit more soundproof. And that's adding some foam to the ceiling just to make sure we don't have any issues. We also plan to reach out to um, any adjoining neighbors of the venue and just make sure that we're all on the same page and we do anything we can to make sure that they're satisfied with, uh, with the venue. Yeah, so, thank you. Yep. Jane. Have you heard from the planning department? Has your change of zone been we approved? Did, uh, last, about two weeks ago, we, we met with Brian Will at the planning department and um, kind of got the process started on, on what we need to do. So there's a, a uh, special permit we need to apply for and also a change of zone application. We had to get a um, surveyor out to look at the space. We just received the site plan back today, actually. And so we plan to submit that application on Wednesday, along with the special permit application. Did they give you any indication on how long the review process would take for them? From our understanding, it's 10 to 12 weeks. 10 to 12 weeks? 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yes, I have. Yeah. So with that delay in on the zoning and so forth, what does that do to your day-to-day -day operations? Currently, we're using STLs just to do events. Um, and I have a separate bar based in Nebraska City called Denty Moore's. The LLC is Backstage Bar. Luther has hired us to cater the events in the meantime until the, uh, the uh, retail license for uh, the Royal Grove comes through. So to, on the chicken and egg situation, is the zoning going to have to be done before you can really activate your license? I believe so, yeah, from what, what we understand. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, staff. Sure. Questions, Thank yeah. you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Gitter-Baird has a staff question. David, could you come up, please? <clears throat> David Gary with the Planning Department. Um, so there was a recommendation to deny this application because of the zoning issue. Can you speak to where you are in the process and what uh, what what else is behind that recommendation? Yeah, well, I think the I guess specifically we're at the beginning of the process of a change of zone, which does take time because that has to go both to the. Can't hear you very well. Can you pull that closer, or maybe the folks in back can adjust the volume? Thank you. Uh, speak like that um, it's just not working very well today we are it? at a point where it is the beginning of the process for a change of zone so that does take a number of weeks because it does have to go through the regular process to planning commission and then back to you at the city council for a change of zone so timing wise we are at the beginning of that process so where we're at is that that what we what has been discussed with the applicant is that there is a need for that change of zone for this to work but we also as is the case with any of these changes of zone that, that we have uh, expect the applicant and the property owner to interact with the neighbors in the neighborhood so that there's an understanding of what that change will be and that still has to happen as well so there's the time is okay in the sense because there's a there's an expectation that there's at least a sharing of information over the change of zone and what that might impact on the neighborhood but uh, you mentioned chicken and egg I mean I feel like we're in a bit of a tough spot because if we actually have rules that don't allow liquor in this location pending a change of zone that may or may not happen, why are we considering this today? And I guess maybe that's even a question for law. Yeah, I think that might be a better question for law, but um, I understand that you do feel that way. And the <laughs> the applicant had submitted their liquor license application before the change of zone issue came up, and the change of zone is just over part of the um, parking lot, not the building itself. Well, I understand that, but we, no. yeah. And, and Tanya. And maybe, Tanya, maybe you can clear this up first. My understanding is we need to act within a time limit, mm -hmm. and if we fail to act, then it goes to the state anyway. That's that correct. correct. Right. You have 45 days from the date the city clerk receives the application to make a recommendation one way <clears> or another. <throat> so in this case, there's three issues. You have a change of zone on the parking lot. You have the need for a special permit for the main building, and you have the distance issues with the outside area. So there's three issues that need to be dealt with on this property. Ideally, an applicant would deal with the zoning and all of those issues before they make application for the liquor app. So in this case, we're just waiting on the application from the, from the business to get started with the planning process 
and it'll work its way through. So that's why we recommend doing a denial. It'll hold their application at the Liquor Commission until they get this issue sorted out. So, And they will still be able to continue as they have been with SDLs? Unless they run out. Unless they run out. They have 12 right. a year, correct? Right. Now, if they make no attempts to make an application at some point to fix the zoning, at some point the city is going to have to say no more SDLs at this location or do something. But right now the city clerk was um, approving those under her authority while giving them a kind of a transition period. So, I mean, if they delay it, that might be the decision that's made at that time, but um, that would probably end up on your, on your plate if that's where we end up, so. Other questions? So 12 SDLs up to six days. So depending on how they do it and they schedule their events, they'll last them through kind of the spring, so. So just to clarify, 12 SDLs, each SDL can be up to six days. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to testify on these items? Next items, please. All right. Next is items 19 through 22. They are the application of Boiler Brewing Company for a Class YC liquor license at 129 North 10th Street, Suite 313 and the application for a Class YK liquor license at 129 North 10th Street, Suite A, and two related manager application of Tad Ertz. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Jessica Greenwald, 121 South 13th Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. I am here representing Boiler Brewery, and um, we are here on an application for a Class Y license, and then also to assign the um, Class Y satellite license to um, one of their existing locations as well, and um, would welcome any questions that any of you council members may have. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on these items? Next item, please. All right, next are items 23 and 24, application of Carrier Entertainment, LLC, <clears throat> doing business as Nowhere Bar for a Class I liquor license at 2050 Cornhusker Highway, as well as the related manager application of Dan Carrier. Please come forward. Hi, would you raise your right hand? Yep. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Just state your name and address. Uh, my name is Dan Carrier. My address is 3360 East Pershing Road. Um, I've wanted to own a bar for the last five years, and I worked in the industry for the last five years to get the experience to do so. Uh, and here we are. I guess this is the big day. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Cindy. So when we got the letter, it indicated that you have a recent DUI that's going through the system. Has that been resolved yet? Um, that was received about a week ago, and um, we are currently working with that. If need be, we can put another manager on the license. I can have someone else manage it for me and basically just advise them, which obviously is not ideal since I've been working for this dream for so long. Um, but if that's what I have to do to make it happen, that's absolutely a possibility. Other questions? John. Oh, with what Ms. Lamb was saying, uh, where we've got the application of yourself as the uh, manager, I'm, I don't know, perhaps we'd have our city attorney here, I don't know if Ms. Skinner's still here, give us some thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. He's Oh, she is here. Yeah, Can I just ask before the city attorney, did you take the class that is required? Um, I am eight? scheduled for March 8th. Um, oh, okay. I'm yes, sorry. because of the uh, urgency of having received that DUI, um, during that day I was meeting with um, the correct people to make sure I get that handled properly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I was, yes. Uh, with the uh, personal situation of Mr. Carrier, is it all right if we went ahead and approved him as manager, or do we, what, what would you recommend that we do in this case? 
Um, I'm assuming that the Liquor Commission will set him up for a show cause. Um, so he'll probably have a hearing one way or another before the Liquor Commission. So either way you rule, we'll probably get him there. Carl? No, thanks. Uh, having a DUI wouldn't necessarily um, disqualify him for the Within license. the last four years, they consider that DWI. So it's quite possible that he would be disqualified. It's a character ability to follow the law. Mm -hmm. It's not an automatic disqualifier, is that right? Um, <clears throat> we have another expert witness ready to come forward. I don't know of anyone that's had one in the lot um, like that that has received approval. <laughs> Do you have you got any information on that? Yeah, I, Brian Hofer, the Lincoln Police Department. Um, a DUI in itself is not a disqualifying conviction. The, there are a set of convictions that are disqualifiers. A, a DUI is not by itself. It will uh, assess enough points in the system that uh, Liquor Commission uses to cause a show cause hearing. So he will have to testify before the Liquor Commission about um, going over those points. It's not, uh, there, there are other licensees that have previous DUI convictions in the city of Lincoln. Okay. But this is pretty short time frame from when he applied to the actual arrest. Okay. And it's not a conviction yet, so. Right. Are you two in concurrence then? Is that? That he'll have a hearing before the Liquor Commission. Oh, it, I so would imagine if he gets approved, <clears throat> it'll be under the condition that he has no liquor law violations himself personally or for his business. And normally we would put that in. I think the resolution was done before he <clears throat> um, got his um, DWI. So we can certainly add that if you choose to do an approval. And it's pretty standard language. But usually in those cases when we're doing that, it's not as recent. Um, it's something recent, but not you know, within a matter of days. So. Indy? so if you put that in the resolution, the conditional approval, would that be no um, violations? Would a conviction after that date trigger? On this event, no. Okay. No. Um, but on any other events, which hopefully doesn't happen in this case. But yeah, no, it would, I would say it's the same event. That okay, so it. even if there is a conviction after we make a decision, then that's not going to be, violate that extra conditional provision? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You want to do any PR on your establishment? Um. Well, we've worked quite, uh, fairly hard in the last, shoot, I started, I was the system manager about six months ago, and we've worked pretty hard over the last six months to turn to much more of a restaurant and bar. Um, so we're working to have some of the best dollar-for-dollar dollar food in town. <laughs> and we're finally getting there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would, it, would anyone else like to testify on this, these items? Next item, please. All right, next is item 25, mm. application of the Comedy Loft Partnership, Derek L. Brems and Robert D. Rook for a retail class I liquor license at 701 P Street, Suite 205. Hello. you raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Just state your names and address. I'm Bob Rook, 925 South 50th. Derek Bremis, uh, 2820 Docks Drive. Okay, tell us about your application, gentlemen. Well, Roy, we're pretty excited. We're going to bring stand-up comedy back to Lincoln, Nebraska. It's been a long time since we've had it here. We're having a regular full-time stand-up comedy club. It'll be right across the hall from the Tada Theater, which is now celebrating its 10-year anniversary inside the Creamery Building. And uh, we're renovating what was a dance studio into a comedy club. And... Uh, my roots go back to stand-up comedy, having started at Noodles Comedy Club years ago and the Funny Bone that used to be down in the Haymarket. I traveled for 12 years as a stand-up comic, uh, opening for Jay Leno and other folks like Norm MacDonald and Lewis Black, and we think it's about time that we, God knows we can use some laughter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and Derek is, uh, we both graduated together from Lincoln Northeast High School, and Derek has got a great background in hospitality, so hopefully it'll be a good match and the ownership of the Creamery Building is very excited about it, and we feel pretty positive. We've uh, started construction, gone through the building and safety, gone through our background check, 
and they found nothing on me other than I turned down a one-way street the wrong way in 1991. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh oh Okay, well, thank you. Are there questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Good luck. Folks. Appreciate it. Would anyone else like to testify on these, this item? Mr. Chair, I would like to move denial of items 17 and 18. This, I need a second. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Larian. Discussion? I think as we had in the testimony that with the zoning issue and all that, this way we can put it essentially on hold and they can get that resolved. Okay. Please call the roll. Eskridge? No. Ayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Chobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? No. Motion carried five to two. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to move approval <coughs> of items 19 through 25. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Uh, I was wondering if we could vote separately on item 24, the manager application involving the recent DUI. Is it possible to separate that one out or? Okay, I rephrase it then, items uh, 19 through 23 and 25. Second. Okay, so moved by John, seconded by Jane. Uh, please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. And then I'd also move approval of item 24. Second. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? We're not the last body to vote on this, uh, but it does come <clears throat> through us for a recommendation. And the framework that we're given to sort of think about these decisions includes recent convictions with alcohol-related offenses, and a DUI is a very serious one, uh, one that the community doesn't take lightly. And so uh, because of how recent it is, uh, it just gives me pause. Um, I certainly would like the establishment and for you to be able to have your dream, but I'm going to vote no because of the how, just how recent that happened. Any other comments? Cindy. Um, so I had the same concerns um, as my colleague, but um, at this point in time, probably because I'm a defense attorney <laughs> and there's not a conviction, <laughs> I'm probably not going to vote. I'm going to vote yes to, uh, to because there is level, another level of review after us, and um, I appreciate that. And, um, and I don't know. I believe not guilty unless proven innocent. Not guilty. <laughs> not guilty unless proven guilty. Okay. Are you sure that's what you do? I, innocent, <laughs> until, unless not there proven. Not until, right. unless. That's okay. Other, other discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? No. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried six to one. Next then, public hearing resolutions. Also, a reminder to the public, when you're testifying, please clearly state your name and address and sign in on the sign-in sheet on the podium. I'll call item 26, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition of claims set forth for the period of January 16 through 31st, 2018. Is there anyone present who would like to testify on a claim before the city? Next item, please. All right, next is item 27, authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement between the city and the State Department of Transportation so that federal funds may be used for construction and construction engineering of the intersection reconstruction at 66th and Fremont Street. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Craig Aldridge, Public Works Engineering Services. Good to see you all again. Uh, here to ask for your approval of this resolution to authorize Mayor Beitler to sign a contract for construction of a mini roundabout at the intersection of 66th and Fremont here in Lincoln. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on this, bids were open on this project uh, last Thursday, which was the 8th of February. Uh, MTZ Construction here in Lincoln was the low bidder, uh, just shy of $397,000. 
Um, just for your information, the engineer's estimate on this project was just shy of 555000 so uh, good competitive bids and a good cost savings to the taxpayers of Lincoln. This project is 90% federally funded, 10% locally funded. Uh, as of right now, today we anticipate construction on this project will start, excuse me, June 4th of this year. It is a 70 calendar day project, which doing the math puts substantial completion at August 12th. Um, substantial completion being everything but grading uh, and basically seating and sodding. And then final completion is scheduled for September 8th of this year. With that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, well, Jane, then Carl. Since you're an engineer, how do you define a mini roundabout? That was my question. <laughs> Good question, and I actually came prepared because I anticipated that okay. uh, question. <laughs> um, and ironically enough, I will be up here uh, two items from now to discuss another roundabout project at 14th and Cornusker. But the biggest difference between a mini roundabout and a traditional roundabout is just the size. A mini roundabout. Um, typically is in the range of 65 to 75 foot in diameter when measured from back of curb to back of curb. And a traditional roundabout is somewhere in the vicinity of 150 to 180 foot in diameter back of curb to back of curb. So that's the big difference. Thank you. Okay, Carl. John, I think I remember we had this, this issue come up long time ago, like five years ago or something. Seemed, I, didn't, haven't we already dealt with this? And what, what took, took so long to get it back? For this particular project? Yeah. Wasn't this, didn't we have this before? Once? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it, <clears throat> Carl, is, is just the, the federal strings that are attached to it. Wow. It's a lot longer process. Um, we've also had to have a couple of open houses on this mainly just due to lack of attendance and um, notifying the public of what we're doing um, and what our preferred alternative moving forward is. And so based on that, um, the federal government, since it's 90% their money, asks us to um, jump through a few additional hoops okay. to make sure that we notify the citizens right. of what we're doing. So I'm not crazy. We have This has been out there a long time. Oh, okay. you may be crazy. Well, but just sorry. Okay. Cindy. Thanks for being here today. Sure. So this is an up in my neck of the woods, and I know that I had a couple of uh, homeowners up there that had some concerns about the boundaries that were going to need it, be needed and um, the right of way and so forth. And um, I want to thank you for having the open houses. And I feel like um, I think probably because you guys have been working on it so long, uh, there was. Um, there were some homeowners that had purchased since it started and before it began and were kind of caught unaware. But um, I understand that you've taken care of all that, those concerns. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Thank you so much. And okay, Benny and then John. I want to go back to the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, first. Go back to the conversation about mini roundabout. There's something at the corner of 11th and D Streets where those energy. Is that similar to what will be put in place? That's correct. That is a mini roundabout. So it's just a slightly raised median in the center and yes. mostly just, just special needs for four way stop kind of. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> New legal description for many roundabouts. <laughs> John? Well, we've got some more nomenclature here. So you mentioned like a mini is 65 feet from edge to edge on the diameter? Correct. So how big do you envision the center round portion? I, I don't have those exact numbers in front of me, uh, Councilman Camp. I can sure investigate that and get you an exact number if you're All looking part, for one. What you think? Oh, would be under a mini. Yeah, definition. on this in this particular roundabout, we're right at 70 foot for an inscribed diameter, which again is back of curb to back of curb. I, I think the center island is is probably uh, somewhere in the vicinity of I'm going to say 45 uh, to 50. Typically, typically we set those with a 16 foot lane a traversable lane and then um, basically the center island in this case we don't have a truck apron um, it's all mountable uh, would be the remainder of that 70 foot diameter so uh, 50 to 55 feet okay well in york england they have a roundabout that's that big that's white paint and in uh, 
St. Andrews, Scotland, they have one that's about six inches wider. So what would you call those? Dots. Holes. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> micro. Okay. Thank God you. bless America. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Thank you, sir. Next item, please. All right, next is item 28, approving a conservation easement agreement between the city, Lower Platte South NRD, and Village Meadows LLC to preserve the natural resources over the easement area located at Outlot D, Village mm -hmm. Meadows 7th edition, Outlot A, Village Meadows 10th edition, Outlot A, Village Meadows uh -huh. 11th edition, and Outlot B, Village Meadows 15th edition. Before you begin, I'd like to acknowledge the arrival of some guests from far away from the Ukraine, I believe. So th welcome. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Higgins. I'm with Public Works. Uh, this conservation easement you see before you has actually been, been, uh, been working on this for a long time, actually since the mid-2000s. We actually was part of the 2000 Beale Slough Master Plan. It was envisioned with that area to get extra over-detention in a lot of areas to better serve the community and to reduce flooding down on Beale Slough. And so this one here, we worked with the developer, both with, uh, with Dick Campbell and with the subsequent developer, Bob Benish, to uh, get some over-detention on these areas over here where they're doing uh, village gardens and village meadows. And we've actually, we actually worked with them. They over-detained this area by about 70% <coughs> and reduced the flooding by about 10% downstream, you know, quite a ways on uh, Beale Slough. So what we're doing here is we're paying for the raw land cost and for the construction and the engineering and some of the storm drainage work that went in just to the parts that were over-detained. And the cost for that is $329,682.85 for that conservation easement. And they're split evenly between the city and our NRD, and the NRD has already approved that. And I've also got uh, with me today, if you want to hear them talk, is Danae Kalkowski, is representing the developer, and also Paul Zillig with the... Lower Platte South NRD is here. So if that, with that, if there's any questions. Question. Lyrian. Just looking at the location, do you have a map that you can put up uh, for sure us? Sure do. That was my question. <laughs> and then just given the location, does this have benefits for the planned uh, fire station that will be going in in about that area on near Pine Lake? Are there storm water management issues that are being addressed and mitigated through this particular project well this one uh, I mean it does reduce the flooding in that area because mm -hmm. this is a uh, upstream of that area a little bit but it doesn't really directly relate to that they're actually doing some items themselves they have post construction over there for water quality there and I think that's fire station I can't remember if that's 12 or 15 well one of those two and they're actually doing some stuff on their own and they're actually up high enough to be out of the floodplain in their area even without this even without this uh, this over detained here okay could you just briefly describe oh. the benefits of this project? Uh, uh, so what it's doing, it's kind of, uh, it's over-detaining, so it's, it's holding extra flood water above and beyond what they're required to do. If you remember, as, you know, as part of the drainage criteria manual, everybody that does a development has to detain, so they keep the flows the same as they were before development. And so they actually over-detained here by 70% to capture extra drainage off that in Beale Sleuth, so to help downstream landowners. And just to reduce the actual flooding on there, we haven't actually not gone through a FEMA map change on that, but it physically does reduce the amount of flooding downstream. Thank you. Okay, Cindy. So, um, thank you. Uh, so, what, this was in the sixteen seventeen CIP. Uh, it was in the CIP, but it was also, it was also in the twenty sixteen uh, general obligation bond set aside for that. Okay, and that's what I wanted to know. It was the uh, stormwater bond that's already been passed right. as a source of funding. Yeah, so the, the funding's already there. The NRD's already got their funding set aside for it, too. So Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right. Next our item is item 29, approving a professional service agreement between the city and Shimmer Associates to set out the duties and fees to perform final preliminary design services for the safety project at North 14th Street and the eastbound on-ramp to US Highway 6 Federal Aid Project. Hello again. Um, here to discuss another safety project, again, this being at 14th and Highway 6, Cornhusker Highway. While I wish I could say this one was ready for construction, I can't say that. 
Uh, we are working through the, still working through the design portion of this project, specifically the preliminary design and uh, NEPA phase, NEPA standing for National Environmental Policy Act. Um, full disclosure, just a little bit of a clarification on the fact sheet. Um, it does say that we have fulfilled the requirements of NEPA. That is not entirely true. We are close to having those fulfillments met, but we're not there. Um, the Nebraska Department of Transportation did give us approval to move forward with um, basically negotiating scope and fees for Shimmer Associates to begin final design, which is basically just putting the finishing touches on the design once NEPA is finished um, so that there's no delay there so that we can hopefully expedite the process and get this thing under construction next spring. Um, so this resolution is simply to amend the current engineering contract to allow for the final design hours, uh, fees, and tasks to complete that. And again, I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Carl? Yes, thank you. So you gave us a hand earlier that a roundabout is involved in this. Is this, this is a full-size roundabout? That's correct. Okay. And um, there's also, uh, this project can't start until after the uh, North 10th Street bridge replacement is, is completed, so that'll be completed this summer? Next, yes, correct, next summer. Okay. And this is to start, you said, in spring of 2019? That's correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, Larry? Uh, thank you. Uh, this, this particular application reminded me of that Abraham Lincoln quote about Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. Is that, these design is important. The $500,000 cost, is that simply for design or will that also be put towards the actual construction of the no, that improvements? No, is, that is simply for design. What percentage of the overall anticipated cost of the project would that design represent? Yeah, I anticipate this one to be a little bit higher than normal. We have had to step back um, on a couple of occasions, again, with, with some of the hoops that the federal government lays out before us, we have had to do a couple of extra open houses on this. Um, that's, uh, that's some of the cost increase. Um, as you know, the university built a soccer stadium there, and so we had to step back and adjust our design a little bit to accommodate what they were, wa what they were wanting to do as well. Um, not to give you excuses, but to answer your question, I think we're probably looking in the range of 20 to 25 percent. Uh, for the engineering costs as they're related to the construction costs. Um, and just to give you a kind of a rule of thumb, typical engineering um, practices for engineering to be somewhere in the vicinity of 14 to 18%. So we are a little bit high, but we did have to step back and, and redo some things based on some things that happened around that area and because of the hoops that the federal government uh, has made us jump through. Jane? Oh, I'm just going to ask if there's the cost share on this then, or is fine, are we obligated for the entire 500000 No, it's 90% federally funded, and uh, NDOT, Nebraska Department of Transportation, District 1, is also chipping in 5%. So on this, the city is responsible for the additional 5%. Thank you. I'm just looking at the overhead. Is it customary to have an overhead at 168.9%? That is Pretty typical for consultants. Some are a little bit higher, some are a little bit less, but somewhere in the 160 to 175 percent range is pretty typical. Okay, thank you. Benny? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've traveled this intersection quite a bit, and I'm excited about the opportunity of that eastbound merger being a little easier and a little safer. Uh, there's a bridge there now. Is it going to remain? How Can you give us an overall picture of what this roundabout will look like? Sure. I wish I, uh, I would have had a schematic. Um, to be able to pull up on the overhead, but um, basically the easiest way to describe it is um, as you travel eastbound on Cornhusker, there's an off-ramp going eastbound um, that kind of takes you up to 14th Street. The roundabout will actually be at the intersection of that off-ramp and 14th Street. The, the current off-ramp going northbound to eastbound on the Highway 6 will be removed and we will actually put a loop ramp on the west side of the bridge um, that is accessible via the roundabout. Um, and the hopes there is that um, by looping around and facing west before you then come back east, 
It gives you better sight distance to be able to see the traffic that you're trying to merge with. Um, to answer your question about the bridge, because this project, um, the purpose of this project and the funding was set up as a safety project, it was specifically set up to be funded to eliminate or reduce the problem at the, the current merge location. Yeah. So because of that, we're not allowed to touch the bridge structure. That was one of the specific um, things that we were told as part of this funding. So the bridge itself will remain in place and won't be touched. Um, but I do know that it is under observation uh, constantly. Um, it's on our listing. It's looked at every year on an annual basis. Um, so. I think I've had a couple of people ask about the bridge, and I was I, I've, I've asked them to be patient. There's a project coming, so I can. Go. Okay, Carl. That that triggers another question because that that gets into the frustration that we have and citizens have, where you you close a an inter, or a, a road for a year or two for a project, and then whoop, we come back and do it. You know, replace a bridge. So, I mean, is there a way to consider? If there is a need to replace that bridge, to do that in conjunction with, with this project? Or is that just not possible? I'm sure there is. It, it probably at this point comes down to funding, Carl. And okay. um, honestly, I'm not, I'm not the guy that secures the funds. I'm just the guy that, that, gets, <laughs> that gets the projects designed and built. And if you, can, if you can find money to build it, hey, I'll, okay. I'll be more than willing to, to help get it designed. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Cindy. Thank, Cindy, do you have anything else? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? <coughs> Richard Eskel, 733 West Cumming. <coughs> My question is, this is a very busy intersection, and it's a very, very busy intersection at 14th Street as you come off Cornhusker, which has quite a bit of truck traffic mm -hmm. so what's going to prevent you know is it going to be super wide to protect it so we don't always have to keep filling potholes or rebuilding curves because my concern is the additional cost after it's built with the truck traffic welcome back Craig <laughs> well I guess to answer that question typically the roundabouts are designed with um, a portion uh, on the inside of the median that's traversable for trucks um, and so uh, in this particular instance and i'm i maybe i ask him to come back up and clarify i'm not sure if he's asking about cornhusker highway or if he's asking about 14th street i think the predominance of trucks at this location is on cornhusker highway the improvements are not actually on Cornhusker Highway; they're on 14th Street, um, and so based on that, we don't we don't see a high number of trucks that use 14th Street that go over the overpass or come the other way. We do see a few, um, but that being said, we don't we don't typically design for the rare occasion. We design for uh, the predominance, which in this case is just single units, passenger cars, those types of vehicles. That being said, we will have a truck apron that will be able to accommodate those truck movements should one encounter the roundabout. Okay, Mr. Esquivel, does that answer your question? Uh, well, I'm talking about it's the roundabout's going to be on 14th by the bridge. Now, there's plenty of trucks that go to the businesses to the north, and there's plenty of trucks that go to exit there to go to the university. So, therefore, and the way you're saying that the roundabout is possibly going to have a eastbound lane come around the roundabout west and then head back underneath the bridge which is tight quarters for a 53 foot truck so you know that's going to take some planning and some costs sure no all very valid points uh to be honest with you i would probably need to double check with our consultant to make sure that they have accounted for those truck movements that is typical um we do account for um, trucks even larger than what he mentioned in the design, but I don't know that for sure without checking with our consultant to, to know that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. 
All right, item 30 is reaffirming the termination on October 1st, 2018 of the increase in local option sales tax as set forth in Ordinance 20197. Jeff Kirkpatrick, City Attorney. Uh, this resolution, the point is to uh, suspend the quarter cent sales tax. It will be suspended at the exact time that, that we intended to when you passed this three years ago before it went to a vote of the people. Um, as we discussed at the time, there's a lack, certain lack of flexibility because the uh, sales tax is collected by the state of Nebraska. They can't make changes on a daily basis or a monthly basis. There are basically four times during the year that they can make changes either to increase or decrease the sales tax, October 1st, 2018 being one of those times. Uh, in order to do that, the city is required to give them notice that we want to have it suspended between 120 and 180 days prior to the suspension of the sales tax. You may recall that when this was put on the ballot, there was some discussion, some hope that if we collected more or the, the projects came in below budget, we could suspend it earlier. And of course, the fact that it is imposed on a quarterly basis means that you have to be fairly exact to do that. As a matter of fact, the, the money and the budgets came in pretty close to what we had estimated, and so we're going to be able to suspend it at the time that we had predicted when it was passed by the people. Questions? John. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think I heard you say up to 180 days before, like 60 to 180, and we're beyond 180, are we not? 120 to 180, we have to notify the State Department of Revenue. So we'll notify them within that window. Okay, so you okay. Okay. Thank you. Other it's questions? not a matter of the passage, it's a matter of whom we notify the Department of Revenue. Okay, one other question. Um, so my last time I looked at these numbers, is my understanding that we would have more than absolutely necessary for the projects. Uh, has there been discussion, to your knowledge, about what would be done with that those funds that were in excess at this point? Well, we talked about in the resolution that the council passed about funding going to the um, fire stations and also equipping those fire stations. So I think the anticipation was that they would be uh, set aside to buy equipment related to the fire department. Okay. Questions? Lirian. Well, uh, that certainly would be a legitimate use. I think the Citizens Advisory Committee had expressed a recommendation that it be used and set aside for future updates to the 911 communications radio system because because that was such a big one-time expense that hadn't been uh, you know saved for over the long term. Do you know what the Citizens Advisory Council has recommended? Have they made a formal recommendation to the city at this point? They, they may well have. Certainly that would fit within the, the resolution and the goal that this council had and the people understood when they voted for it. Okay. Well, maybe if you don't mind updating us when you get a chance on where they are in their process and if they will be providing a recommendation to us. And, and it may well depend on how much excess right. there is, which okay. is still a little bit up in the air. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Oh, sue me. Cindy, sure. excuse me. When will we know how much extra after the suspension of it? Well, um, We'll know how much is raised after the suspension, so November, December, but I, it'll be sometime after that before we know how much exactly is spent for the fire stations because that's an ongoing process. We haven't even begun building you know, most of them, and as you know, there are certain change orders. I know that uh, uh, Tom Cassidy has talked about how his goal is to keep it within the budget, and so if it's necessary to make cuts or modifications um, during the construction that's his goal. Thank you. Hey, John. Yeah, I think at this time we're projecting a one and a half million dollar excess, and uh, mm -hmm. within the contracts we've awarded to their contingencies, so it could be some time before we know exactly what would be left. Yes. All right. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. John doesn't talk loud. We're projected to have $1.4 million in excess, but we won't know until after the dust settles on this. Next item, please. 
All right, next is item 31, approving a consultant agreement between the city and AGA Consulting to provide structural repair documents for city municipal parking garages for a two-year term expiring on September 1st, 2019 for a sum not to exceed $50,300. There's someone here to speak on this item. I was Oop, oops. No one. Okay. Hmm. Well, I was hoping we could just get that defined, what a structural repair document is. Uh, that'd be nice, but we don't have anyone here, so we'll find out later. <laughs> Next item, please. Next, our public hearing ordinances, second reading, item 32, approving an amendment to the Lincoln Municipal Code, section 25.06.385, to include an exception for cooking recirculating systems, which will allow the use of factory-built commercial cooking Recirculating systems in accordance with the International Mechanical Code. Hi, thank you. Uh, Chad Blaha, Building and Safety Department. Um, I was approached by uh, Councilman Christensen to take another look at uh, these the, these machines. Um, uh, essentially, what the what the proposed change would do would allow these recirculating um, cooking machines. These are, uh, I think of them as ventless uh, commercial kitchen hoods. Um, Traditionally, you have the large hoods that vent to the exterior of the building. In, in some buildings, this becomes uh, prohibitively expensive or it's a small enough, uh, small enough establishment that folks uh, desire to use these machines. They're a lot less cost um, than the full type one commercial cook, uh, cooking hoods. Uh, traditionally, Lincoln, um, the Lincoln Task Force for the Mechanical Code has recommended uh, prohibiting the use of these machines due to what they thought were uh, increased fire hazards and uh, maybe some environmental uh, um, air quality concerns. Uh, the code, International Mechanical Code, as published, allows the use of these machines. And so what, what the three changes to the municipal code uh, would do would revert back to the published mechanical code and um, allow these machines to be used, um, permitted through our office and inspected through our office, um, um, just like uh, any of the other um, uh, commercial cooking equipment. Um, a couple of the couple of points to to make in in our process in re-reviewing this these items. Um, like I said, traditionally uh, Lincoln has prohibited these, and this goes back a long time. Um, uh, perhaps to the 90s. Uh, when, when, when doing our research, we wanted to look at a couple of different things. We looked at what other jurisdictions are doing and are there, uh, to the extent we could determine, real, uh, real increased fire hazards. Um, I had uh, our chief mechanical inspector do some research into the jurisdictional question and what we found is there really are no other jurisdictions that specifically prohibit the use of these machines. Um, and we didn't, we didn't, we didn't survey every peer sized city, but we, we talked to a lot of them and that's, that's what we found. Um, similarly, um, I asked our, uh, fire inspector who normally deals with, um, restaurant related, uh, establishments to do some research into, uh, you know, fire hazards and he did not come up with a, um, uh, documented fire event specific to these types of machines. And so we felt that the requirements placed on the manufacturers to, to build these machines, one of which they all have to have a integral fire suppression system built in, just like a type one hood that vents to the atmosphere. Um, and those fire suppression systems are required to be inspected by a third party on a six month. Mm -hmm six month basis and they have to have that documentation, um, uh, the, the maintenance documentation um, as far as cleaning and, and, and upkeep. Uh, so we, we had felt that this was enough to bring the item back to um, the, the task force to take a look at again uh, that as task force members were willing to meet um, even though um, you know, we weren't really didn't have to didn't have to talk to them, but we felt it was important to get their opinions. And and instead of a unanimous vote, uh, two of them actually had changed their mind. So it was still majority vote to continue to uh, prohibit them, but um, we felt we could still bring forward a proposal that would allow 
the use of these machines in the city of Lincoln. And uh, I have uh, my chief mechanical inspector, uh, Mark Howard, and then Chuck Schweitzer from the Fire Prevention Bureau to answer any technical questions that I most certainly am not qualified to answer. So, John. Yes, Mr. Blah, thank you. Could you give some examples of where these uh, hoodless but yet circulated uh, mm -hmm. apparatuses would be used? Oh, they could be used in a number of things. Like uh, like I explained earlier, um, I, I believe one of the uses they were originally intended for is kind of open air arena, kind of the food carts uh, kind of things. And so um, whenever you, uh, you know, don't have your traditional large um, commercial kitchen, uh, kitchens uh, setting, um, a lot of the places that have asked uh, may be a convenience mart where they have, you know, some food selections in their gas station. They want to add some fries or something, want to be able to do that, or uh, some smaller some smaller food establishments within a, you know, a multi, multi-use building where you have smaller tenant spaces, but it's n not convenient or even possible to vent to the, to the atmosphere. Uh, I suppose it's possible some some churches uh, may be interested in, in in these for for some of their uh, events, that sort of thing. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on this item? Hello, uh, Mike Breda, 5537 Ezekiel Place. I'm here representing Shivers Sweets and Treats down in the Indian Village Shopping Center. Um, I can honestly say I use an auto fry, not knowing I wasn't supposed to. So with that being said, uh, after speaking with the people from auto fry, the cities around the United States that got rid of the code that allowed them you can count on one hand. Lincoln happens to be one of them. So, I, they are UL certified. It's fire suppression and everything. Um, they are so much safer than a regular fryer and, and hood for employees because they never get near the oil. It, you, you put the food in a, a door, you close the door, it drops into the oil, it's all enclosed. And then when it's done cooking, it drops it out into a basket. So the employees, I have young employees, they never get near the oil, never have any issues with that. So um, it is a big part of my business. Without it, my business will have to close. So. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your business? Uh, we do ice cream and uh, fair kinds of foods, um, shaved ice. Uh, we have many, many flavors of that. So uh, we do, you know, French fries, um, mozzarella cheese sticks. Uh, we actually do tasties and onion chips. So, Carl, thank you. Could you explain a little bit about the cleaning of the apparatus? How no, yep. Pre um, prevent the grease buildup. And as long as you clean them every day, every other day, uh, they say, you know, clean them once a week and you're fine. Uh, as long as you keep the grease buildup down. Uh, they, they do have three filters, just kind of like a regular hood. Um, they've got the baffle filter and then uh, that just needs cleaned. Uh, every three months, the next filter is a wire filter and you replace that every three months and then there is a charcoal filter that is replaced every two months and they sell a kit it's 300 and some dollars and it basically tells you when to change them throughout the year um, we change ours religiously to what they say we're supposed to do i've actually had general fire and safety in there every six months uh, they change the fusible link on it they check the fire suppression system and everything um, which I was surprised they didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be using that machine, so. Thank you. Okay, other questions? What, tater tots? You do tater tots? We don't have <laughs> those yet, but. Okay, just maybe, checking. Maybe. I might come by. Taking notes over here. He'll, uh, he'll write that down and uh, you just call ahead, Larry. And All right, there you go. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify on this item? 
Very good. Next item, please. All right. If not, that concludes our public hearing. We can move into the voting session. Just a moment. Um, uh, oh, yes. We, <laughs> we need to back up one moment. Thank you for reminding me, Carl. Yeah. We saw that uh, somebody made his way in in a tardy fashion. Yes. Please. <laughs> we, we, we will go back to item 31, please. You're very gracious. Thank you, and I apologize to the council for the miscommunication between my staff and myself. And we need to be here to tell you about a two-year agreement with AGA. This is our... Uh, engineering and consultant on the structural soundness of our garages and uh, we have a particular interest in in fact a garage that we don't own that we're thinking of seeing if we might be able to um, make an arrangement to check on its structural soundness um, because uh, there's a possible transaction to be done on that basis in other words we do have reason to do this and do this in a timely fashion and it is a normal contract with a long-standing consultant. Um, this is the consultant, for example, that we used in determining the Lumberworks liner um, garage. And I again apologize for any inconvenience to the council of my absence uh, to remind you what this topic was. Okay, so, questions? So yeah. this is for like when you take your car to your mechanic before you buy it? kind of looking for someone to do those services is it yeah and our own garages we also make sure that our garages are maintained very well and we check their structural soundness okay so and yes in this case that would be the, that would be one of the pieces of work that they do but they also review the structural soundness of our own garage okay so this is for all our own garages That's right. That's thank right. you very much okay all right and very good we're good anyone else like to testify on this item all right, before we go on to our voting session, uh, Mike, we're not going to vote on your issue until the 29th of this month. So unless you really want to be entertained by the rest of the meeting, <laughs> you don't need to be here. <laughs> okay. Let's go into our voting session. All right, we'll start with item 26, the report of claims against the city, introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. <laughs> Item 27 is the agreement with the State Department of Transportation for 66th and Fremont Street, introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. Item 28 is conservation easement agreement in, introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. Item 29 is the prof professional service agreement with Shemmer Associates introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 30, reaffirming the termination on October 1st, 2018 of the increase in local option sales tax introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Discussion? We are ending a tax. Just take note, please. As, pro as promised. As promised. I'm enthusiastically going to support this. All right. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 31 is the consultant agreement with AGA Consulting introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried, 7 to 0. Public hearing ordinances second reading is item 32. Ordinances third reading, item 33 is street and alley vacation 17006, vacating a portion of 17th Street right of way, generally located between Vine Street and a point approximately 300 feet north of R Street, introduced by Shobe. 
So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Benny, seconded by Lyrian. Discussion? Mr. Chair, um, I think there's some concerns about this, and I'd like to make a motion to place this on pending with a public hearing date certain March 12th. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Cindy. Discussion? I'd like to okay. understand also, I don't know if staff wants to come up, but also if someone from UNL is here just to discuss what the impact of the delay would be and what would take place during the interim to address concerns. Uh, Steve Hendrickson, the Planning Department, just to let you know that, yes, uh, Mr. Jensen is here with UNL, uh, who would like a chance to address that if that's acceptable to the Council. Okay. Steve, members of the Council, my name is John Jensen. I'm the Real Estate Manager for the University. Uh, my understanding is that there is a motion pending to delay or continue this action. Uh, I'd just like to say that the University uh, is not, this is not in the University's interest. Uh, in addition, I would object to this. Uh, for the reasons that uh, the continuing partnership between the university and the city continues as we do street improvements on 16th uh, Vine Street and uh, to 17th Street, uh, we continue to plan and program for the pedestrian way on, on 17th Street. Uh, and the university has posted the $80,000 bond uh, that was requested. Uh, and this has been planned and programmed for some time, and we'd like to be able to move forward uh, with this plan and for the safety of our students. So. Uh, with that, I would answer any questions that you guys may have. Carl. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Jensen, for being here. Uh, that 17th Street is currently closed. That is correct. And uh, that's for the removal of debris from the uh, demolition of the dorms there. When's that work supposed to, the cleanup work supposed to be completed? Uh, I am not sure of the exact completion date for the abatement of that project. I, I believe it's within the next few months. My understanding is that we're not planning on opening the street between the, uh, in, in, at least for a few months, and discussions are ongoing as to whether or not that will be reopened. So, so just why, why would um, <coughs> why would delaying this until March 12th be a, be problematic when you don't have use of the street um, uh, at that time? The reason being is that we continue to uh, work with the city with some street improvements on uh, 16th and Vine and uh, just that this has been pending for some time now and we'd like to see some resolution and uh, the ability to move forward with this project um, and we just hope that, that uh, we don't decide to continue at this time. Other questions? I still have a question just for, in the, for the folks who are interested in delaying what what would take place in the in the time of the delay? What questions would need to be answered? And well, frankly, I think there's room for a compromise on compensation to the city because, uh, as John and I expressed in the last meeting, uh, this is while it might not be the steal of the century, uh, it comes in number two when it comes time for the city to be compensated uh, in a, in a deal with the university, and I think that there's significantly more value in that property than is being acknowledged in this agreement. And I think there's some time where that can be explored directly with the university. Could city attorney come up and you can have a seat if you don't mind. And can you come up and just advise us on, you know, what our regulations are regarding fair market value and, you know, is there room for comp Can you please address sort of the process that <clears throat> usually goes into this and if urban development wants to speak to it as well, it's fine. I just want to try and understand what room there is uh, in this yeah. process. Uh, Jeff Kirkpatrick, city attorney. Uh, I would say uh, a couple of things. One is that when we're buying or selling property, we generally want to have an appraisal moving forward. Uh, sometimes those appraisals are done through a contract with a professional appraisal service, and sometimes those are done in-house with our real estate division, and that was what happened here. You heard testimony, I believe, last week as far as what our own real estate appraiser, uh, based upon what our practices have been, what appraisal she put on that value, uh, although I think she would acknowledge that it's always somewhat challenging, uh, as oftentimes we run into when you're in a situation where it's really practically one buyer, one seller. I mean, we often um, vacate alleys or streets where we know there's only one person that would be interested, and that's the adjoining 
uh, property owner. I would s submit that might be the situation here where you have the university on both sides. Uh, I'm not sure it's a situation where you're going to put it up for auction and figure out who wants to buy a street from the city. Um, but that's really all I would have to add to the matter. I mean, we do have, I think, uh, as a city, that obligation to have some sort of appraisal done and so the taxpayers know that we're not just giving away some sort of a sweetheart deal. So is the request to delay to have an official out of the external appraisal done? I think it's just to open a discussion with the university. In my experience, uh, uh, regardless of what somebody might appraise something at, uh, when you ask what was the value of something, it's what one person is willing to pay for it and another party is willing to sell it for. That's the value. And I think there's a lot more value. I'm representing the citizens of Lincoln. I think the citizens of Lincoln think there's more value to that property than $80,000. That's all I'm saying, and I want to open a discussion on it. Jane? Maybe Dave can answer this question. I know Michelle Bachmeyer you know, stated that uh, the value is diminished because of so many easements to the city on it. Do you know what percentage of that, is it 80,000 square feet, is really covered with easements that are beholding to well, the I'd be city? willing to give up all those easements and let the university maintain those. <laughs> and to maintain their, their I, sewer. I, think no. I don't have much to tell you about the specific piece of property. I can tell you about past practices and what we use as standards. Because uh, we have two responsibilities. One is when we buy and one is when we sell, and they're not identical. Our obligation as a seller is to sell at fair market value. Our obligation as a buyer, I'm sorry, our obligation as a buyer is to buy at fair market value. And that's where we would use an appraisal. We want to know what the market says it's worth and we'll pay what the market says it's worth. The city's not in a, in a situation in which it hopes to get bargain rates below market over the barrel kinds of results. We pay what the market, we're told, is fair. That's not true when we sell. The standard there, I believe, historically, that was communicated to me by previous real estate uh, uh, folks, Clint Thomas and uh, Steve Worthman, and that was that we had an obligation to sell at fair value, which is not identical. Fair value might be less than fair market value, but there ought to be a darn good reason if it is. But it isn't the same standard. However, the standard in all sales is a willing buyer and a willing seller, and what the two of them will agree to. When we are buying, it's at or above an appraisal. When we're selling, it's what we are comfortable with and has a justification of what's reasonable. The ultimate determiner of whether or not the city is willing to sell is what this council chooses to do, and it's an act of voluntary choice on your part. We're not obligated to sell land. We can bring you what we would regard as fair value, but that's just uh, you know, a clinical version of a reading of the marketplace and the options that are there. If the council doesn't see it that way, you are the protectors, in a sense, of the city's well-being. And if you choose not to sell a piece of property, you can choose not to sell a piece of property. And Michelle's also here. So she can fill in some blanks, perhaps, on we the easements I can We have questions for Michelle. Well, I think Michelle can probably answer the well, easement this question. Well, is, this is not a public testimony. This is, this is not public testimony. I'm not going to take testimony unless there's a staff question. Okay. Uh, and, and I think I've given it, the staff it, response in that case. Yes. So we can wait for another day if he um, wants to come I back. know you had questions about the easements. Yes, how just, much, what percentage of the, that land mass has easements? I don't have an actual okay. percentage, but I do have this map. Um, this is Vine Street over here. Uh, what we're vacating, I believe, is 300 feet uh, north of R Street, so it's almost down to here. Um, the red, anything here in the red is a storm sewer easement. The green is wastewater easement on the west side, and the blue right next to the green is the water line, uh, water main that runs down there. So you basically, before the university could even use any of this as being buildable, they'd have to move the easements. They shifted over to the east. They might have a limited amount, but I don't even know if that's engineering-wise you can do that. Fire has said they want access to these buildings, so anything over here, they want to be able to drive over. 
So that pretty much limits you being able to build anything on that little strip there. So I'm, I mean, and I can have the engineers figure that out, but I don't think there's a whole lot of area that's really buildable. So, so the easements are all to the benefit of the university, correct? So they can receive these services from the city? That, yeah, I would assume so, since they own on both sides of the road. So those, so actually they need, a benefit. They need them. A, right, a be, they need them. A benefit to the university, are, those easements but certainly are. But the cost are. of relocating those easements. Well, I don't think anybody wants to relocate them. I'm just saying that they're, they're there because they benefit the university and our, our ability as a city to continue to service those utilities is to the university's benefit. Okay. This is public testimony. I don't know if this is appropriate. I well, this is, I, this is, I, I agree. This is public testimony and, and it we're out of order. Today, so so. I, I would just like to add as well that <laughs> some cost savings for the taxpayer is the, the complete elimination of operation and maintenance of 17th Street. Uh, going forward, as you know, uh, 17th Street is a street that's not in great uh, condition. And, and part of this partnership going forward is the university absolving all the costs of operation and maintenance of what, as Michelle has pointed out, is a slab of pavement because there's not going to be a buildable space uh, going forward on 17th Street. So uh, any future cost to the taxpayers is going to be removed by uh, university. Okay, I'm going to end this here because uh, this is not a public testimony period. This is for staff questions during the voting session. So Thank you for your time. Uh, you got, are there any other que staff questions? For Michelle. Okay, go ahead. Michelle, you know, I guess... We were a little puzzled by the formula that you had referenced, and it wasn't very clear. Is there a set formula? Because you, you do the right-of-way uh, evaluations for years, and so I guess we wanted some certain formula that you were working right. to come up with this calculated value that was very clear. You basically try and determine what the highest and best use of the property is and what land value it would have. Um, in this case... I did use my former coworker's assessment of it, and I really didn't. I had limited information in the file on how he came about with that number. But if you were going to take five dollars a square foot land, because it's probably more residential property than it is commercial in this area, I, I think he downgraded it for the easements, and you assume about a twenty percent value on the five dollars, which is about a dollar a square foot for the remaining land value. And that's similarly what we do in other cases. It, you know, if it's full of easements, it doesn't have as much value. If it's open space that you could actually build on, it should be higher, 50%, 80, 75. So if the, if the city of Lincoln had to buy this amount of land to build a road on, what would we have to pay for it? Well, you'd have to determine the land value first. Would it be a dollar a square foot? No, but it might start out as five dollars a square foot depending what if we're just getting an easement or a fee taking this land is encumbered with the easements it's all not, to the it's, and those easements are all to the benefit of unl they are but they're yeah. but you still have to determine that they have a, a an effect and on the I, land i suggest value. the value is significantly greater otherwise we wouldn't be going through all these gyrations over a one month delay well yeah, I, so, I know. All right. Are there any other staff questions? I'm going to call the roll on the delay. Did we have a second on that? Yes, Cindy seconded it. Thank you. Eskridge? Yes. Gayla Beard? No. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shob? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried six to one. Next item. All right. Item 34, change of zone 17031, application of gauge investments for a change from AG Agricultural to R3 Residential at 7721 Porchy Lane. Introduced by Shope. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 35, conditional zoning agreement to establish the obligation of the developer to pay the city upfront for ongoing maintenance of a street adjacent to property 
to be developed in exchange for the city accepting the street without it being constructed to urban standards at 7721 Porchy Lane. Introduced by Shope. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 36, change of zone 17028, application of planning director for various changes of zones on properties generally located in the vicinity of the former Missouri Pacific Railroad corridor between North 22nd and North 35th Streets. Introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? <clears throat> yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 37, approving a conditional zoning agreement between the city and ABC Electric to allow ABC Electric to continue to use its property under the changed zoning designation while providing for a buffer zone between the street and commercial activities on the site for property generally located along the south side of Y Street between 24th and 25th Streets, introduced by Shope. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. A motion carried 7 to 0. <clears throat> Item 38, Plan Amendment 17007. Amending the 2040 COP plan to de designate as a N neighborhood center on map 5.1, existing and proposed commercial centers, and as commercial on the Lincoln area future land use map, property generally located at the northwest corner of South 98th and Van Dorn Streets, introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Cindy? Yeah. Um can I, so this is related also to 39 and 40, correct? Yes. And so I, I have a staff question. I think just kind of, I could just ask at the beginning. I'd sure appreciate it if there's, yeah, Dave Carey from planning. Thank you. David Carey with the planning department. Thank you. So um, this this is all 91st to 98th, and that's why I wanted to ask this. And I just wanted to clarify a couple things and confirm. Um, we heard some testimony last week, and um, in reading the what was happening at the planning commission, there was um, questions about the roundabout at 91st and Van Dorn. And my understanding is that that roundabout, there was some concerns that it was placed too far south, which was in the maybe the Firethorn, and now it's actually been changed to be moved further north. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think there's been ongoing consideration of the exact design or the location of that design, which ultimately will not be fully determined until we get more into the details of the project, but there has been ongoing discussions on exactly the footprint. Okay, and but, but so at the hearing, uh, to clarify, to clarify, I had understood that there actually had been a change made since the planning commission. Did I did I misunderstand? Is that just a discussion, or there has been a change? I think that there's been a shift, a slight shift to the north to minimize the impact on the south side. Okay. Uh, there also has been ongoing cooperation with the property owner in the south to provide. The, you know, whatever, you know, to a degree, whatever's needed for the right of way, so that there has been ongoing negotiations and discussions on that. Oh. But yet, there, there's been an attempt to bring it as far north as it can, but there might be, there's still going to be some impact on the south side of the road. There's no, no way to avoid that. But I think, yes, there's been some discussion on making sure that we're minimizing that as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my other question had to do with the, um, the height waiver. Um, and I, I'm wanting to be certain if in uh, passing these, are we actually, is the, is the height waiver part of what we're passing, what we're being asked to pass today? Can you, I, I'm actually going to ask Steve Hendrickson to come up to answer that just because I want to make sure we're answering the right question. Okay, thank you. So, Steve, there was a, a question um, about the highway, there was a request for a height waiver because a four-story building, there would need to right. be parking underneath and so forth. Yes, excuse me. That is part of the, um, of the PUD overall aspect of it. There's 170-foot separation from 
Van Dorn to where those, that height waiver would start. So it is, it is separate from any of the residences, but that should be a part of um, the overall PUD as well. Okay. And, and that's so the change of zone. Gotcha. And so will they, thank you for clarifying that. Will, uh, once that, if we should pass that today, then the, uh, will they be ha being able to build that without further oversight or is there further oversight involved? Uh, no, that, that increases the height, so there's no further review of the particular buildings whatsoever. Okay, and then one last question, because there was some uh, discussion about for such a high density um, residential area about there being maybe not enough access points. My understanding in last week's testimony was that uh, at the point that the commercial uh, community, I guess, commercial uh, portion was developed, that at that point in time there may be another discussion about access? Yes, th there's this property that's under consideration 91st and 98th. There's additional property to the west that is designated as commercial in the comprehensive plan. And so they've stubbed roads to that property so that there could be additional connections both over to 84th Street and then an additional connection down to Van Dorn. So the access would not solely be down to resort drive from the apartment area. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but also note, just to address your previous question, the motion uh, to amend on the attachment for the annexation agreement, um, one of the two drawings that is in there is the revised 91st Street roundabout, just that moved it a little bit further north. Okay. Uh, David is correct. It's, it's still an ongoing design, but part of the reason for that amended attachment was that it moved forward, uh, to the north a little bit. Okay. Thank you. I thought that's what I saw, so I wanted to be sure. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very I'll, much. I'll just, oh, I, we're, since we're going to be voting on a lot of these items, I'll just give yeah. my comments then too. And um, yeah, Cindy mentioned a lot of the concerns that were raised during this process and, uh, you know, annexations, voluntary or city initiated bring a lot of change and um, people need to be able to ask their questions, get their voices heard and have a, their needs addressed. And while, uh, you know, in these situations, everyone isn't always 100% happy. I think it is to the credit of this process that despite having had an annexation agreement ahead of time that didn't require the installation of a roundabout, there has been a coming together of both sides to, to make sure that that can happen, to address the safety concerns and the traffic concerns to the tune of almost a million dollars. A $750,000 roundabout is going to be installed uh, and I hope that the folks involved in that feel like that's a, a victory for, for their advocacy work and, and that uh, for the long-term growth and planning of the community. Okay, other comments? This is another good thing. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Item 39, Annexation 17019, annexing approximately 73.53 acres of property at 91st and Van Dorn, introduced by Shope. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Taylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 40 is change of zone 17030. Application of Matadal LLC for a change from AG Agricultural to R3 Residential for a planned unit development district for a residential area with single family, multifamily, and residential transi transition uses with various waivers consisting of 78.66 acres at 91st and Van Dorn, introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 41, amendment number 1 to the annexation agreement for Van Dorn Street Coalition between the city and the parcel owners to reflect changes in the development plans for property located north of Van Dorn and west of 98th Street, introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? I'd like to have to a motion to amend number one. I'd like to move motion to amend number one, which is uh, an adjustment to the roundabout showing that it is moving a little further north. Second. Mo moved by Jane, seconded by Cindy. Discussion on the amendment. Please call the roll. 
Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Now on the main motion, please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Item 42 is text amendment 17001, amending chapter 27.63 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to special permits. Introduced by Shobe. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Lyrian. I'd like to move that we delay this item for three months to our meeting on May 14th um, to allow for uh, exploration of maybe an alternate uh, method of. Uh, allowing a liquor license for open harvest, uh, but setting this proposal aside in the meantime. And um, this has been a really, uh, you wanna get a second on that for this discuss it more? Okay. Thank you. Second from Carl, yeah. This has been a really complicated and, and tough case. And uh, I think all of us, I won't speak for all of us, but I know that we, you do. we mm -hmm. share the frustration for this, um, for open harvest and vendors in their situation and you know, despite how well-intentioned and understandable their efforts are at creating a grocery store exception, um, I think, you know, there are still problems with that proposal, as we heard testimony last week, and really having to do with whether or not there can be a distinction made for a grocery store and whether or not that would hold up over time. Um, and and that's that, that possibility is a real problem for neighbors who, through their well-intentioned and understandable efforts to protect their property values and to protect their neighborhoods from the potential negative impacts of off-sale alcohol, had gone through public process to put the current rule in place. So if there's another way that both Open Harvest and uh, the concerns of, of neighbors can achieve their objectives, I think this amount of time will allow for that kind of a process to to unfold and try and find a balanced approach that, that gets people uh, what they need in our community. And there may be some zoning tools we can utilize to accomplish this. There's no guarantee, uh, but taking that time will allow us to explore uh, maybe an alternative idea, exp get some community input and feedback, and report back to council by, by May 14th on whether or not there's a feasible alternative. Carl. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate um, this idea, um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> because uh, there, I don't know that there's been an issue uh, that I've been contacted about privately <laughs> <laughs> as often as this one. You go to the movie, you go to the, you know, why, it doesn't matter where Grocery you go. Store. Somebody, <laughs> somebody hits you up. So, so this is an issue that people care about. I mean, we heard uh, approximately 10 people testified in favor and about 10 in opposition. But, but as a mediator, what I was listening for was, was the, they were kind of talking about different things. Uh, the, those who testified in support of Open Harvest were, were supportive of their store. You know, they love Open Harvest, They're, they want to see it thrive. Uh, those who testified in opposition love Open Harvest too, but they were concerned about the impact of this uh, text amendment change on neighborhoods. And so to, for us to take a step back and to figure out, okay, is there a different way to accomplish this, I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, mediation terms, it, it potentially could be a win-win for everybody. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that this item be delayed and Oh, Cindy. oh, Cindy, you want to talk about this delay, too? Thank you. I should have put my hand up, but you were looking at his face. So, okay. yes, I do. I, just a little. So, um, I do appreciate uh, looking uh, for a little extra time if we're going to be looking at other options. Um, I know that this is one of those ordinances that is of special concern to the older neighborhoods in Lincoln, of which a number of which are in my district. And um, I think that it's... Uh, I know that there are a couple ideas being considered, and I think that for those folks in, in Northeast Lincoln and that those that I've heard from, that being able to have time to really consider whether something different would be broader or narrower or acceptable uh, is especially important. So I appreciate that coming forward, and I will vote in favor of the delay. Thank you. Moved and seconded, delay till May 14th. Please call the roll. 
Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Rebold? Recused. Shope? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 43. Will you hold for just oh. a moment while mm -hmm. we get Jane? Welcome back. Please continue. Okay. Next is item 43, change of zone 17037, application of Jerry Boyce for a change from R3 to R4, residential on property located at 3720 North 1st Street, introduced by Shope. So moved. Second. Moved by Benny, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp. Yes. Christensen. Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Item forty four, annexation one seven zero zero seven, annexing approximately seventy point zero one acres of property located at O and North one hundred twelfth streets, introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved by Jane, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Wait, excuse what? me. <laughs> you just want to talk about everything, don't you? Okay. Not sure what I'm planning to do here. <laughs> Um, so I, I just have a couple of staff questions. I want to clarify just this whole package of stuff having to do with Dominion. Okay, so, so we, you want to tackle all of it together? Can I? I, I, I just I think if I have the questions answered at the first one that it keeps me not having to ask specific questions throughout. All right. So thank you. Thanks for coming forward, Mr. Carey. We carry with the planning department. Thank um, you. I think we'll be might potentially bring up other staff if there's some specific questions that we want to try to get addressed okay well and and we've had a conversation today because I got some maps from some of the folks out at uh, at Sky Ranch Acres and I know um, that there was concern about the well house and there we have two motions uh, now I think three in front of us and um, the big difference was what what would happen with the well house correct okay and so um, I wanted to clarify a few things first of all it, at this point in time, the developer, nothing that they're going to do uh, is going to encroach upon the well house or require the well house to be moved, correct? Correct. Okay. And then, and you and I had a conversation about whether the, um, there was some concern that, that the road's going to be a little closer to the well house than some folks are comfortable with because what happens if a, if a car leaves the road? and and goes into the well house and and you you were going to maybe try and check to see about whether the developer was um willing to place bollards were they called i think the 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 idea and topic of bollards to potentially protect the well house uh, is something that's been brought up for discussion there's there is no agreement as to if that is indeed completely necessary or who exactly would do that um, i think that that is an ongoing topic of consideration and I think it's something that can continue to be discussed. And, and for today's purpose, I think I would suggest that that is something that city is, a, is uh, committed to continuing that discussion, um, but that the action today is not dependent on the, the re resolution of that topic. But the idea of bollards being put in place to protect the well uh, is something that has been discussed and certainly could be part of a plan moving forward. Okay, and so the city will keep an oversight to determine whether in the, in the city's opinion that would be necessary, and then... Yeah, I think that that's more or less where we've left it right now, is that we want to keep that idea and that possibility on the table, uh, but there is not a resolution yet as far as if it's necessary, when, if it would for sure happen, and who would be responsible. And so you have some metrics that you look at to determine if it's necessary? I don't think I'd say we have metrics necessarily on that. I think it's a, probably an ongoing consideration of how, uh, how much of a safety measure do we want to put in place to protect the well. Okay. It's and not, is that not necessarily, this is, not, this is a fairly unique situation. Right. And it's not something that we have. We can go to a, a book and say, yes, it's time for the, for the, uh, the ballers to be put in. Okay. And then there was also some concern about if it should eventually have to be moved and if it was, in fact, um, built on city right away and you and i looked at some documents that seemed to indicate that the city signed off on the final uh after it was built prior to occupancy permit correct 
Yes, we, we looked at some documents, uh, and I, what I also conveyed in part, as part of our conversation was that there is, I, I think the way to put it would be some disagreement on who would ultimately be responsible for a potential move of the well uh, if it were to be needed, and that has absolutely not been determined. Um, right now, that we don't see a need to move the well. I th at this point in time, the city has a position that it, is, it would not be the responsibility of the city if it had to be moved. But again, this is a topic that is an ongoing conversation. I think what's needed is to get more clarity on what documents are available, what they say, and exactly then get to a more of a firm point on who would be responsible. But again, it's not, nothing at this point is saying that that well needs to move. Okay, so at this point in time, the city's not taking any position it needs to move. Correct. And then if that decision at some point in the future needs to be made, then and the city is committed to continuing discussions to determine whose responsibility that would be. Yes. Okay, and in no way, though, is it going to fall to these folks uh, that are doing the development unless something changes in their planning. Yes, I think something would have to change to have that be the outcome. Okay, and if that if there was a change uh, of that magnitude, then the city would be involved once again in having to finalize the plan. Is that right? I would agree with that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Jane? Um, David, I also had questions um, about what triggers the actual construction of the access roads that need to allow the new homes and residents in those new homes to move in and around the neighborhood and, and bypass Sky Ranch. Um, can you go over that? I'm, I'm not really clear on it. I know Mr. Hunsinger did a follow-up clarification. He said that, um, please note that, that the 74 lot threshold cannot be met unless the Crescent Moon Drive connection to North 104th Street connection to Holdridge has been constructed constructed because phase one is limited to 35 lots until the connection of Crescent Moon Drive to North 104th Street is completed. And he referenced the item 3A I page three line 17 to 12. Um, is what enforcement mechanism does the city have they to make sure that uh, that access road North 104th is actually constructed. What what leverage do we have to with the developer to, to make sure that that road is in place? Right, that's a good question to ask and get answered. Um, I'm going to call up Steve Henriksen at this time to be available for the details of, I think we're, we're transitioning here as far as making sure that we understand what amendments, motions to amend we are, we are acting on and, and dealing with here because there were numerous, put, numerous amendments put out there. So Steve is, uh, as usual, very prepared um, for this discussion. Uh, and I think so let's kind of walk through kind of that, that first question, which is how does the uh, motion to amend ensure that the phasing happens so that there's an alt alternate route out? Uh, Steve Henriksen with the Planning Department. So. Uh, this was an exhibit that was put together by the neighbors that helped to show how all this connected together. And so one of the things that hasn't really been debated because it was worked out first with the neighbors was this is the, the phase one area here. Um, just say this is Sky Ranch. We have Holdridge along, Holdridge is along the north. We have O Street along the south. The large green area here is basically the lake in Waterford Estates. Uh, the orange is the future LPS school site. 104th is the street that goes along the east side of the school site, and it has several homes that will be, that are already in the process of being final platted in our office. So these developers, separate from everything else that are going on, uh, they are working on building both this street, most of this area is already done, and they are final platting 104th Street and the lots on the east side of it. So before this first phase can be done, one of the conditions that's already in there, doesn't need a motion to amend or anything else, is that that phase one would have to include this connection over to 104th Street. So just for them to be able to get to the lots, to be able to show people, you know, if that's where they start their phase one, they need a way in. Uh, since the barricades would be placed across both Piper and Beechcraft as the very start of phase one, and that is one clarification that is in both the neighborhoods motion to amend and in the developers is that those barricades go up before you you get anything that could start to bring traffic through those two streets so that that's how it initially works out and then the discussion point has been the developers um, 
motion to amend says, initially this was gonna say you had to have 74 houses have occupancy permits before you would remove the barricades. Developer pointed out, well that was in phase one that only has 74 houses. What if somebody buys the lot next to them because they want a bigger lot? You'd only get 73 houses and you'd never remove the barricades. So the developer's motion adds another 15 lots over here to say between those 89 lots, you have to get 74 of them occupancy permits and then you'd be able to remove the barricades. Because again, what we're trying to do here is balance that, yes, there's neighbors who are existing neighbors concerned about the traffic going through, but you're also gonna have future neighbors who are gonna be living along 104th Street who are just as concerned about having construction traffic go through, which is something typical of, of a new neighborhood. Um, so then the uh, developers, so their motion to amend basically says 74 of these first 89 need to be done. The newest motion to amend that was submitted over the weekend from Sky Ranch, um, it says, well, we'd like to have 70% of the ones in phase one, and then there's a phase 3B over here, and they'd like to have 70% of those done, which effectively means 106 houses would have to be finished and occupied uh, before the barricades are removed. So that's the, the basic difference between the two is one ultimately says 74 houses have to be done in this phase. The, the, the Sky Ranch one adds some more over here for an ultimately 106 that have to be done. Both of them also include though that if for some reason there was some delay in getting this road done, they have the ability to build um, a missing portion of shorefront and connect to the existing shorefront out to 98th Street or they have the ability to connect down here on O Street at 105th and come up that way as well. So it allows them, this is shown as uh, phase two and phase three B, that either of those phases could go forward um, if for some reason they are delayed on phase one, because they can't do phase one unless they have that connection done. So, so that's the leverage the city has. If they don't have uh, 104th completed and done, they cannot, Correct, so our office is in charge of reviewing when they submit a final plat up here, and they may only do 35 of the 74 lots first, we would be making sure, okay, what is the situation on this road? Is it done, is it under construction, Are the bid signed? What, what is it, because the requirement is, that has to be in there. And trust me, we will not forget that. Okay. It will be so very you could... crisp in our minds okay. uh, that that's an important part of it. So you would not grant the occupancy permits? Correct, and, and, and that's what's okay. in here is that and again, that's already part of this. The amendments just have to deal with how many houses have to be done before time. Thank you, that's very clear. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We're we ready to call the roll on item 44. Can I just add something? No more questions, more questions, okay. Not a question, sorry, just discussion, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, we recognize that not every concern of the neighbors is addressed through these compromises, but I think it is worth noting that because of the neighbors' input, we have had a number of changes since this came before us. And um, in addition to the attention and the pledges you just heard about making sure there are access points that help distribute traffic and prevent one access point from being overloaded and, and any one group of neighbors feeling the kind of undue burden of that traffic that potentially could be there, um, there will be the, the use of those barricades uh, until mm -hmm. the occupancy hits a certain level and the creation of a construction road and uh, the willingness that's been made to post signs about weight limits on the roads. Uh, the affirmation that the well can remain indefinitely um, despite its location and the decision that Dominion sewage and water won't run through, um, won't pass through Sky Ranch acres, and that further road improvements in Sky Ranch acres will, will only come about at their request. So all of these modifications really did come about through the neighbor's advocacy and their, their concerns were heard and, and I hope that that helps to mitigate some of uh, the the fears that they have had throughout this process. Um, and as Steve Hendrickson mentioned, our job here is to try and weigh those concerns that are potential with the other potential concerns that new neighbors will also 
be subject to additional traffic should we you know not have multiple access points but the point is we are trying to distribute this as fairly as possible for both current and future residents of this area and so uh, I intend to support it for all, for those reasons and appreciate the work that has gone into trying to find a, a revised plan from the original one that was brought forward. Carl. Thank you. This is, is it's difficult. <clears throat> and for the, the residents of Sky Ranch who are here or watching, um, you know, we, we hear you. Uh, you live in a, an area that, that is, um, is changing as our city is changing and and this is um we've had other neighborhoods uh with changes a lot a lot like this and we're a growing city and we uh, anticipate within maybe 10 years an east beltway is going to be built uh we planning shows extended growth uh farther to the east to the beltway and probably beyond um, so uh, this is something, it's important that we have street connectivity uh, for the safety of residents, uh, for the convenience of residents, so that you can get from point A to point B in the most efficient way. And um, I'm pleased that planning is, is working hard to, to make sure that, that those concerns that you have are, are addressed. John. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to make a quick statement that I appreciate the way the Sky Ranch uh, residents have been contacting us and explaining their position and concerns, and I think that's gone into a lot of the discussion that we've had uh, among ourselves and the council, and hopefully with the full discussion here that there's going to be with the bollards and so forth, protection for their streets in the interim, and that we can see this development grow in a way that uh, will be responsible. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? I, I'm sorry, I have a question. Did the motion to amend come forward? Not yet. Get, That's not on this item. We're only talking about item 44 so far. I know. I, I thought that we had a motion to amend on 44. Am uh, I on 45? We, we were, it's on 45. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good question. I was wondering the same thing. Um, okay. Just Can I just have a moment? Because mine's record seemed to show that we had a motion to amend. The motion to amend is on 45. I should one on, do you not have one on 44, Teresa? No, we do not. Okay. Yes. We have one on 45 and two on 46. 46. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have those. Thank you. I'll vote yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Did I vote? I don't know if I got to vote. Did I? <laughs> Did you call my name? Yes, you were second. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. See what happens I didn't, when you I start didn't interrupting hear, the voting yeah. session. All right. <laughs> Next item. Okay. All right. Item 45, approving an annexation agreement for Dominion at Stevens Creek. Introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved and by Jane. Seconded by Carl. We have an... This one, we do have a motion to amend. I move a motion to amend number one. Tell us what it says, Jane. Basically, it just uh, deletes the words under construction and replaces them with approved for construction by executive order. Second. Moved by Jane, seconded by Cindy. Discussion? Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Now on the main motion. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 46. Change of zone 17015. This is for a change from AG Agricultural to R3 Residential and O3 Office Park at O and North 112th Streets. Introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved by Jane. Seconded by Carl. And we have amendments here no 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 not this one okay discussion please call the roll eskridge yes gayla baird yes lamb yes raybold yes shobe yes camp yes christensen yes motion carried seven to zero next is item 47 special permit 17022 this is um appeal of mark hunziger from the planning commission's approval of a special permit 
to allow Dominion at Stevens Creek Community Unit Plan for up to 433 residential dwelling units, including single-family units and townhome units, with requested waivers at O and North 112th Streets, introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved by Jane, seconded by Carl. Now we have two amendments, and these are competing amendments, correct? Yes, we have well, motion to amend number three, which is from Sky Ranch, and motion to amend number two, which is from the applicant. Okay, let's hear about, um, is there any preference which order we go in here? Let's do motion to amend number two, okay. the applicants. All right, and let's describe what motion to amend number two does before we consider a first and a, a, a second. This is deleting all of lines 9 through 13 on page 3 and inserting in lieu thereof the following. Prior to commencement of any construction, the permittee shall, temper, shall install temporary traffic barricades on Piper Way and Beechcraft Road at the connection between Sky Ranch Acres and the Dominion at Stevens Creek, which shall remain in place until such time as occupancy permits have been granted for 74 single-family units in Phase 1 and in Phase 2 north of Century Lane of the new development, as shown on the phasing exhibit for the community unit plan. Add a fourth condition to note phase two or three B may begin prior to phase one. Okay, I need a motion to motion. So move. Move by Carl. Second. Seconded by Cindy. Discussion? To make this clear, thank you for coming, folks. Thank you. Um, just to be clear, make sure I understand, everybody up here understands, this motion requires 74 occupancy permits to be issued. Is that correct? This is the 100 one, isn't it? Yes, that is correct. And the, this is the updated version of this, which is in both phase one and phase two to allow for more of those lots to be available to reach the 74 number. Very good. Any questions about to make sure we're clear what we're voting on? Not staff questions at this point, right? Just kidding. I just, Cindy, go ahead. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. So okay. I want to make sure you see my hand before I see your hand. You, you go ahead and comment away on this amendment. <laughs> okay. So I really appreciate all that's been done in, uh, on behalf of the folks at Sky Ranch and, and certainly on the behalf of the developer. And I actually think that this probably will alleviate some of the concern. I know that there was... Um, a desire maybe that there be 100% uh, occupancy or whatever of the first phase, but I think this gives them probably a little less traffic congestion to begin with um, because it kind of spreads out the um, availability of, of um, building and uh, development. And so I am supportive of this and I appreciate that, um, that the all the concerns have been taking play have been taken into consideration and the city will continue working with these residents should the well have to be moved and keep a close eye on uh, what's going to happen as the roads go in so that if the bollards are needed um, and i think that the commitment on behalf of the city and on city planning to do that goes a long way with these folks and so um i'm happy to support this amendment jane has a question um probably for for david you know in um we're not talking about motion to amend the second one that was offered by Sky Ranch, but was there a commitment from the developer about the traffic signage restricting uh, traffic from trucks, you know, to a minimum weight, not right. to exceed? Uh, that, that was actually a, a side conversation with Public Works Department as far as being a reasonable installation of some signs to put a weight limit on those local streets. So that is not part of the commitment. It's not part of this motion to amend. It's not a commitment from the developer. It's, it's again, it's that part of that ongoing consideration with the city and the neighborhood to install that, those signs when, when it's requested as well as, as, as and, and appropriately. So is it the responsibility of the city of Lincoln to do the sign installation or is it the developer's responsibility? I, I want to make sure that there's a clear understanding on that one. My understanding, unless uh, someone from Public Works wants to correct me, um, is that it would not be the responsibility of the developer to put those signs in. It would be the responsibility of the city to designate that 
there certain is a weight limit truck on those streets. Weight correct. limits are prohibited. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So now to be clear again, we're going to vote on the amendment. This is actually amendment number two, correct? Correct. And it will require 74 uh, certificates of occupancy to be issued before the the barricades come down. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Now we have a another motion to amend. Is it this is number three? Number three. Number three. And my understanding, correct me so staff if I'm wrong, that if this passes, then it supersedes the one we just passed, correct? My <laughs> Having just passed the previous motion to amend, I believe you have taken a position that that is one you were comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I believe the most clear action would be to deny this motion to amend so that we know what, which. So just don't act standing. on it. Mm. And just not act on it. We can always just choose not to move it or second it. Right. I believe that's true. So is there a motion for amendment number three? Seeing none. Please call the roll on the main motion. Can we just clarify the, the, the vote on the main motion since it's an appeal? I always like to kind of make sure we understand what a yes or a no vote is when it's an a, appeal. A yes means we approve I just, the proposal. Correct. Nice to have clarity. Does. Yeah, uh, Jeff Kirkpatrick, city attorney. Uh, there is always some confusion, but the appeal only acts to place it on your agenda. And then it comes before your agenda. If you vote in favor of it, you vote yes. If you're opposed to passing it, you vote no. It's as if, as if it was already going to be on the agenda, but in this case, it showed up because of the appeal. Right. Yes. So Thank you. we so would voting be voting. To, I'm to, sorry. Uh, you're voting to uh, either approve the special permit or deny the special permit. Okay. With the uh, amendment. Correct. Correct. Thank yes. you. Okay. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gayla Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Resolutions on first reading are items 48 through 51. Ordinances on first reading are items 52 through 54. Our pending list date certain is item 55. Our regular pending list is items 56 through 61. Anyone wishing to address the council on a matter not on this agenda and not scheduled for the, a future agenda may do so at this time since it is an open microphone session. Come on up, sir. Richard Esquel, 733 West Cumming Street. I have missed a few of these meetings, but I have been advised I should start attending again. Give you some background on me. I graduated the UNL in 75 with a BS in accounting and economics. In 1985, I obtained an enrolled agent's designation, which means I can practice tax law in any state and nation. I did let that expire. Between those two times, I spent five years in federal law enforcement, two in internal audit, and three on criminal. Therefore, I have talked many times on TIFF, and I don't believe that people understand the ramifications of TIFF. I don't, and if you understand the ramifications of TIFF, you should be prosecuted because TIFF takes tax dollars away from this city's operation. Now, whether they're replaced from the state or not, that is still the people's tax dollars. We are funding businesses to do things that is their obligation if they want to build in this city. It is not the city's responsibility. It should be the builders. I can't get TIF money for a $200,000 improvement on my house, but you're doing it to businesses. But at the same time, that 200000 on me, I could pay that back over four, 15 years like you do a TIF with a free loan. But I don't get it. But businesses do. This is just something that the mayor and Mr. Lantis have thrown in front of us. And it's only happening to majorly 
the downtown area. It doesn't benefit out the residents. It benefits downtown area. The mayor's idea of what he wants to do for improvements and the city council is going along. TIF is nothing but a ripoff to the taxpayers. It's a free loan. I can't get a free loan. And then it removes tax dollars unless it's supplemented by the state. 64% for education and the remaining maintenance for city and county. So it's penalizing the schools. I've talked to the school people and they said that it's affecting their enrollment, especially in these developments because they don't collect all the money. So I wish you would consider TIF. Another issue is I want to thank you for looking for, out for the citizens of Lincoln tonight on that one amendment. It's a good question and I appreciate you considering what the effects of the citizens are. Another thing I have talked about many years ago and I've talked to my state senators on is the road condition. Now, I've talked about wheel tax for the larger cities. There are so many people that use our streets more than I do and yet pay zero wheel tax for using our streets. Now, Omaha tried it a few years back and the state canceled their efforts. So I've contacted my state senator concerning these, concerning TIF and the wheel tax issue, and he said none of the cities have brought this in front of them about why should they charge people who work in the city, go to school in the city, and don't pay for any improvement One minute. on our city streets. And they said that it will go nowhere unless the cities that have wheel tax try to get an amendment to them. But, you know, the streets are terrible. Uh, they're not, non, they need a lot of maintenance. And this extra revenue for streets by these people would go a long ways in maintaining our streets and infrastructure of our streets. And it needs to be brought up to the state by the cities that have city wheel tax. Otherwise, it's going nowhere. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? Would anyone else like to testify? Mr. Chair, seeing no one coming forward, I'd move for adjournment and also remind people we will be respecting President's Day next Monday, so we'll see you in two weeks. I need second. a second. Thank you. Moved by John, seconded by Cindy. Please call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Motion carried, 7 We're adjourned. <laughs>